Welcome to the Cybersecurity Simplified Podcast, where we take the mystery out of today's top security threats and solutions. When it comes to cybersecurity, most businesses focus on prevention and detection. That sounds reasonable, but today's guest, a former CIA hacker, presidential cybersecurity commissioner, and Air Force cyber wingman, argues that approach is too little, too late, literally. Businesses are compromised on average 27 months before detection. Instead of waiting for the inevitable breach, he advocates a proactive approach designed to stay one step ahead of your adversary. Stay tuned for this engaging discussion with Dr. Eric Cole, cybersecurity expert, author, and serial entrepreneur about his mission to make businesses safe in cyberspace. Hi, everyone. Good to be back on the Cybersecurity Simplified Podcast. My name is Susanna Song, your co-host here. And I'm Dave Barton, CTO of our networks, also co-host here. And just a short time ago, we discovered that both David and our guest here, Dr. Eric Cole, are both Air Force veterans, both in cybersecurity and both loving their jobs evangelizing about cybersecurity. So small world. A very small world. Well, welcome, Dr. Cole. I, I'm very intrigued by your your past. Tell us a little bit more about how you got into uh, the CIA as a hacker and then later to become a presidential cybersecurity commissioner. So, yeah, I was uh, going to college in the 80s in computer science. And back then it was really engineering with a couple of programming classes. So I was sitting in a Fortran class one day going, is this really my future? Is this really what I want to do with my life? And I, I believe that that life will sort of make these coincidences happen. So I go down to the co-op office and say, hey, I'd like to do an intern in, sci- in uh, computer science. And they go, oh, tomorrow the CIA is recruiting on campus. We have one slot left. Would you like it? <laughs> so one thing led to another. It turns out that I finally after 19 years of life, found an organization that liked my boring life. The fact that I really didn't party, really didn't drink. It was a super geek. They, they really liked that. So one thing led to another, and uh, they hired me as an intern working for them. And this was in the early days of operating systems. So just to date myself, one of my first projects at the CIA was to basically evaluate, analyze, and hack NT, Windows NT, to see whether it made sense for the agency to migrate their entire infrastructure to Windows NT. So so sort of nostalgia moment in terms of uh, going way back on those operating systems. And then how did you then later become the commissioner for which president? Uh, It's funny. It depends on which state I'm in. I say either 44th president or President Obama, depending on uh, on, (laughs) on, on whether you're blue or red, uh, (laughs) because we're getting a little political today. I've also Uh, worked for other recent presidents, but because they have a a lot more energy around them, I don't always uh, bring that up. But but the way that happened was I after I got out of the CIA, I decided two things. One, that I don't like working for other people. And that I'm really an entrepreneur at heart, a cyber geek entrepreneur. And two, that I really love defense more than offense. It's mm-hmm. easy to break into systems. So I, I'm basically a serial cybersecurity entrepreneur. So I, I got together with some folks and we built a company called TSGI, the Cytex Group. We sold that to Lockheed Martin. And I was brought on as their uh, senior scientist in cybersecurity reporting to the president. And so I started getting a lot more involved with the politics, helping to influence the country's uh, cybersecurity plan. And then based on that work, got placed on uh, the commission with President Obama to help design and build out what we need to do to protect and secure our country from attacks. And as you can imagine, that was many, many years ago. So things have changed pretty significantly mm-hmm. back then. But, but the one thing that shocked me the most, uh, even back then, and it's true today, is because the United States, we basically built out the infrastructure for the internet. Unlike other countries, we don't actually know all of the ingress, egress points to the internet. So like if you're Russia or China, you can throttle control and monitor traffic. And as you know, a year or two ago, Russia actually took themselves off the internet for uh, 24 
hours just to test and verify their virginity. We can't do that. So mm -hmm. as a country, there's so many exposure points that we basically have to take a completely different approach to protecting our country than other countries would. Yeah, it's interesting. Very interesting. So, Eric, I, we, we teed this up at the intro, but, you know, David and I talk a lot about, you know, the prevention to the detection and then to the response. But you bring even before all of that, the importance you really underscore the proactiveness. What does that exactly mean to you and how how should business leaders approach being proactive in their cybersecurity? So, so to me, there's many different sort of problems and challenges of how we go about cybersecurity. And the first one is most companies assume they're secure. So they assume that the fault state is we are secure. And then when a breach happens, they wake up, they hire a CISO, they invest in cybersecurity, and they hire a big team. But the reality is you're not secure, right? So yes, you can wait to have a breach, you can wait to pay two or $3 million in ransom and all the fines and all the penalties and all the impact to your business and reputational damage, or you can accept the reality that the default state of your company is you are not secure. So if we are going in that you are not healthy, you're gonna to go to the doctor, you're gonna start taking medicines, you're gonna start taking vitamins, you're gonna start being proactive in that approach, you're not gonna to wait to get put in the ICU. But I look at most companies are falsely believing they're healthy when they're not, and then they don't address cyber until they're in the cyber ICU. And then at that point, it's a lot more work, a lot more energy and a lot more reactive. So to me, assume you're not secure, recognize that 100% security doesn't exist. I am still blown away that I talk to CEOs today and they're like, Eric, we'll hire you to do an assessment, we'll hire to bring you in, but you have to guarantee when you're done that you're 100% secure. And I'm like, really? That, 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 just, that just doesn't exist. I said, I can make you 100% secure. Let's put you out of business. Because the law of cyber is the only way to be 100% secure is to have zero functionality. So whenever right. you add in any functionality at all, you decrease security. So you're never, ever going to be 100% secure. And companies need to address and own it. One of my big mottos is don't shy away. Don't be embarrassed. Embrace the breach. Breaches are going to happen. Mm. The goal of cyber is not to never get attacked. The goal of cyber is to minimize the frequency and the if impact of a breach, 100%. not avoid the breach. Yeah, I agree. You know, it's funny. You you mentioned it, Eric, when uh, a long time ago I interviewed for a CISO gig and I was sitting in the office with the, the COO and he says, uh, he says, I need you to make this network bulletproof. I said, well, that's easy. And he looked at me and I said, let's just turn it all off and go home. <laughs> and I said, if, if you interview anybody who says they can, don't hire them because they're lying to you because or they don't understand the problem. And you're right. It's such a moving target that our goal has to be minimize the impact, minimize the risk, uh, embrace it to your point, because this is how we learn. This is what makes us better. I, I agree 100 hmm. percent. What steps then? You know, you can say it's going to happen, right? A breach is going to happen. We need to minimize the impact. What practical steps then should every CEO, every board, every business leader consider when, you know, say that they come to you, Dr. Cole, and say, hey, help me be, help me take those pro proactive steps. What should they be looking at? So first and foremost, we have to recognize that cybersecurity is different than IT, even though it's sort of grown out of IT. IT is a technical problem. If you're looking at five nines, uptime availability, it's a technical problem. Mm -hmm. Buy more pipes, buy more servers, buy more redundancy. With technology, you can fix IT. The problem is they think cybersecurity is an IT problem. And, oh, if we buy more tech, if we buy more this, if we buy more that, mm -hmm. I mean, cybersecurity is probably the worst when it comes to chasing buzzwords. AI, behavioral analytics, it's like, okay, none of that stuff matters if you don't know what your risk posture is or anything else. So it's recognizing cybersecurity is not an IT problem, it's a business problem. It's going in and asking a very simple question or really two simple questions. What is the value or benefit of doing this? What is the risk and exposure? And is the value worth the risk? Mm 
It, it's yeah. really that simple. And then to me, the next critical step, which so many organizations ask, what is your risk posture? What risks are you willing to accept? And the problem is it goes back to what David said with like, we don't accept any risk. I'm like, okay, get done petting your unicorns, stop taking drugs, and let's have an adult conversation, right? You are going to have risk. So let's come up with a risk posture. So now the vice presidents and directors and business decision makers know what is and is not acceptable. Because if you don't have a risk posture, then anything goes. Then every risk is accepted. So let's come in and say, this is acceptable, this is not. And then when business units go outside the acceptable risk, then security can engage just with those projects. Mm. Yeah, and, and I might argue that before the risk posture is is deciding on a framework and then execute on the framework. Because the framework, to your point, Eric, is going to point out where your risk is. And so for for me, when I am coaching folks who ask that question, um, you know, pick a framework. I don't care what it is, but then violently execute that framework. Make it number one, and it's gonna the outcome of that is gonna is gonna identify the risk posture, it's gonna identify the gaps going to identify a plan to help you get whole. And it may not be the best framework, but it's better than what they have now, which is, in most cases, Eric would probably agree, not very good. Now, you, your spot on is, I work into a lot of organizations, and the first questions I ask is, okay, show me a list of your critical assets. And they're like, what do you mean? I'm like, well, what are the critical assets and business processes? Mm -hmm. You, if we're going to go in and start assessing risk and implement security, you need to have that, and they don't have that. And those are key parts of frameworks that are in place. So the next question go, okay, show me your prioritized list of risks, and they don't have any of that. So yeah, your spot on is you have to do the fundamental blocking and tackling of knowing what your assets are, what are the threats and vulnerabilities, likelihood impact, and what are those risks, and then use that to drive decisions. Unfortunately, what most companies do is they throw money at the problem. If we buy enough technology yeah. and put enough technology in place, it will make us secure. But here's the reality. Technology, no matter how automated it is, requires humans to tune, analyze, and react. And therefore, if you buy more tech, but you don't have enough people, you're basically generating alerts that are basically just noise and nobody responds or reacts to them. Yeah, absolutely. We well, say, go ahead, I was David. Gonna, I was going to dovetail on that. Um, I saw a stat this morning, Eric, that said mid-market to SMB size companies have an average of 88 apps that they have to manage. <laughs> and if you think about the enterprise, that number is about 180, mm -hmm. 180 apps. And so you've got risks they don't understand. And, and to your point, if they can't identify that was critical, how can they even think about securing it? So yeah, I'm I'm with you. It's it's a uh, it's a tough battle for the defender, but like you, I, I prefer that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, and and for those who have followed us uh, on this podcast, know that we we reemphasize those three business problems of cybersecurity. That's too many tools, not enough talent to manage those tools, and then too much data. And, and if you find a threat, who is going to respond to those threats, right? Because God knows how, how much data is out there and how many threats some of these tools are, are producing hourly, right? And so it, it, we we'll often say it's, it's finding that the actual real threat is like a, a needle in a haystack of haystacks. Now, that's so true because I will tell you every incident – I've worked on for the last two and a half years. When we go in and we look at all of their tools, some of the tools alerted on the attack. Some of the tools actually caught the attack. The problem is they were generating 5,000 alerts a day. The team could only handle 20. So it was basically lost in the noise. So, so yes, these, these tools are basically over alerting to the point where it's just noise and it's not valuable. So yeah, I, I agree completely. It's better to tune down your tool and only have 20 high priority alerts that your team responds to than you have your tool cranked up where it catches everything, but nobody's responding and nobody's reacting. Yeah, for sure. As we, this is, this is David doesn't know this yet and our viewers don't know this yet, but this is the last 
episode of 2023 for our podcast. We've had such incredible thought leaders on this podcast. As we end this year and you having so much experience, uh, Dr. Cole, what can you predict for 2024? <laughs> Any trends, anything cybersecurity uh, challenges that that we are heading into in 2024 that uh, that you want to address or that, we, that that might be interesting for our viewers to hear? I mean, the, the big one, and, and I've sort of been seeing this, but just in the last two weeks, I was just talking to my team about this this morning. The shift is already happening in which attackers are not going after the big companies. They're not going after the media companies. They're going after individuals and small entities. We had uh, my EA, her brother has a small landscaping company. He lost 250K. We had another oh. two person company. They lost 100K. And for big companies, that's not a big deal. For small companies, that can paralyze you. But here's the reality attackers are realizing and recognizing that these large companies, while they might not be perfect and they do have exposures, they have security. They have teams, they have monitoring. So yes, I can spend six months trying to break into them and get them to pay me a five or $10 million ransom, or I can go after mom and pop and grandma and grandpa and individuals. And yes, maybe I only get a hundred dollars or 10 K or a hundred K, but you do that 50,000 times because they don't have security. They're not aware. They don't have any protection. They don't have any monitoring and it's much easier and simpler for people to go after. So I, I just urge people this holiday season, if you have any security knowledge, you're sitting down, uh, whatever holiday you celebrate with your family and friends, have a conversation because they're going after individuals now. And the number one group, and this bothers me the most, the number one group that's targeted by attackers today are people over 60 because they have money. They're a little naive. They want to <laughs> invest so they believe and trust people. And they're the ones that click on the attacks. And, and that bothers me because you, you want to go after me. You want to go after my buddies. That's fine. But leave Nana alone, right? right? Mm -hmm. Nana should be off limits. But unfortunately, these attackers have no morals and no ethics. So it's just to me, I'm seeing this huge shift of these attackers going after the most vulnerable, the most gullible, and the people mm -hmm. that have money, which unfortunately are individuals and small businesses and not as much the bigger companies. Yeah, you are spot on. And and for those small businesses, uh, you can, and this is just a, a plug for, for small businesses. You're not alone. You know, make sure that your IT firm or your managed service provider has a robust, you know, cybersecurity uh, solution, you know, 24 seven coverage they can now get, they can get enterprise solutions at a predictable cost. I mean, every small business now has an opportunity to leverage an MSSP. So if you're a small business leader out there, don't try to do it yourself. Be, you know, focus on your business and outsource to uh, an MSSP that you trust that has solutions 24-7 uh, coverage. David, would you agree? Yeah, I do. And, and I think to Eric's point, um, even if you're a small business, don't think that you're immune or that they don't care about you because you are the low hanging fruit. Um, big companies to air point have a ton of investment. They got folks, they got services, they've got lots of things and, and the small businesses don't, but they have data, right? And the one, the one thing I saw a quote today that I thought was interesting, every company is a data company. Even if you think you're not, you're a data company. You could be a dentist's office, you're a data company. You could be uh, a farm. Guess what? You're a data company. So your data is at risk. Doesn't matter how big a company is. There are very inexpensive, easy things you can do to help make it hard for the bad guys. And you should absolutely research that and do those things so that you don't end up having an extinction, extinction event for your business because that will happen. Yeah, absolutely. Any final thoughts, uh, Eric, as we close out this episode? Just a final thought that sort of pigeon tail and what we're saying is it doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter how big or small you are. It doesn't matter if you have a dollar in the bank 
or a billion dollars in the bank, cybersecurity is something you have to deal with. Cybersecurity is something you have to address, whether you're a parent, a teacher, a doctor, a lawyer, a CEO. So to me, this idea that, oh, I'm too small or nobody's going to notice me is no longer just like everybody needs to understand and know general fundamentals of living and health. Everybody needs to understand general cyber hygiene. And if you're behind on that area, you need to catch up very quickly or you're going to pay the price. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Cole. And as he said, pro being proactive is a must. He hear what he had to say and think about even over the holiday break, you know, what steps can you and your business take to be proactive in cybersecurity. And thank you to our listeners for joining us. If you have any feedback, if you have any questions for Dr. Cole or for David or myself, please contact us at podcast at highwirenetworks.com or leave a comment below. Well, thanks again, Dr. Cole, for joining us. And we'll see you guys back here next year in 2024 for another um, amazing set of episodes. Uh, and we will make sure uh, to answer any of your questions and heed any of your suggestions. So be sure to join us for our next episode in 2024. Until next time, I'm Susanna Song. And I'm Dave Barton. And you're listening to Cybersecurity Simplified. From all of us here at Overwatch by Highwire Networks, thank you for listening. Don't forget to subscribe to the podcast, rate the episodes you enjoyed, share, and leave us a comment. We'll catch you next time on a Cybersecurity Simplified podcast. Remember, the more you know about cybersecurity, the safer you'll be. To learn more, visit us at highwirenetworks.com slash podcasts.